안녕하세요. 이 강의에 오신 것을 환영합니다. I am Kiano with the ARP, and I would like to welcome you to our program this evening. ARP Virginia is thrilled to be collaborating with Asher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University to bring our members a sampling of the rich program offered by OLLI Mason each semester. Greetings from the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. Ali Mason has been around for over 30 years, serving curious individuals who participate in lectures, clubs, trips, and special events, as well as volunteer opportunities, such as teaching and service on committees. I want to welcome all of our Ali Mason members, as well as those of you who are in Virginia, and across the United States online through our AARP connection. I want to especially welcome our sister campus, Mason Korea. We are very happy to be collaborating with Mason Korea to bring this Live from Korea series to you. There are many things you can learn and do at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University, and I encourage you to visit our website to learn more. Ali, O-L-L-I dot G-M-U dot edu. Thank you and enjoy the presentations. Hi, I'm Mark Ginsburg, George Mason University's Provost and Executive Vice President, and greetings from George Mason University, Korea, where I am today in beautiful Songdo and in Incheon, South Korea. It's a pleasure to encourage you to take part in and participate in Live from Korea. You know, George Mason University and the Oshler Lifelong Learning Institute have a long time partnership. And this new program that brings together people from our campus in Incheon and Songdo, South Korea, and provides an opportunity for our colleagues from Ali to learn about some of the issues in Korea, some of the cultural heritage and wonderful experiences that people have had in Korea, and to participate in and learn about the importance of the relationships between the United States and South Korea. George Mason, South, George Mason in Korea is an important campus, an integral and related experience that our students have the opportunity to participate in. And I know that you too will benefit from, enjoy, and have the opportunity to learn about these important relationships. I hope you enjoy Live from Korea. Greetings. I'm Robert Matz, Dean of George Mason University's campus in Korea. Mason Korea and Mason Ali are delighted to collaborate to bring you this series live from Korea. Today's presenter is Dr. Roland Wilson. Dr. Wilson's is the second of two presentations related to the conflict between North and South Korea and the prospects for their reunification. Dr. Wilson is currently the program coordinator and an associate professor for the Conflict Anal Analysis and Resolution Program at George Mason University, Korea. He is the founder and co-director of the Peace and Conflict Studies Center Asia at George Mason, Korea. Dr. Wilson received his PhD from George Mason University's Carter School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Though born and raised in the US, Dr. Wilson speaks fluent Korean. Let me tell you a little bit about Mason Korea. Students who apply directly to Mason Korea spend three years here and then a year at our Fairfax campus or one of our other Northern Virginia campuses. Students who go to George Mason in the US can also come to Mason Korea for study abroad for either a semester or a year. If you'd like to learn more about Mason Korea, including opportunities for students to study here or possibilities for supporting scholarships for Mason Korea students, please go to our website at www.masonkorea.gmu.edu. That's www.masonkorea, all one word, .gmu.edu. And now, on to our presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Dr. Wilson, as was said earlier. 
Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, presentation this evening. I hope you can all enjoy it and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, North and South Korea in the, in the greater region. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. Uh, so let me get in right into the presentation. Uh, I have a lot of uh, slides and information to try to provide to you. Hopefully we can get through all of it within an hour and a half and we can have a great conversation at the end uh, over some questions you may have or, or some more details that I can provide to you. So, uh, the, so here's the table of contents that I want to talk to you about today. And of course, I'll do a brief introduction about myself so you know where I'm coming from and why I'm teaching in such a way. Then a little bit about a conflict analysis and resolution perspective. It's a very centric perspective, and I think you'll enjoy uh, the way we look at conflicts and other social issues we have. Additionally, then I want to talk about some key definitions and theories that I think can be applied to everyone in life and how we look at different way, different issues. And then we're going to talk about some assumptions when it comes to the region and the Korean Peninsula. We're going to talk about some challenges. And then finally, some recommendations that I have and how maybe we can start to get over the 70 years or more of conflict between North and South Korea, which is really uh, the center of what's happening within East Asia today. So let's get started. So first of all, I always like to recognize everybody for coming out today. I realize that all of you have busy schedules. And the big time difference is uh, the later in the evening here, or where you are, and where I am actually, I'm not even in South Korea. I'm in Dubrovnik in Croatia. The, uh, we're doing a study abroad with the, the students from both the US and Korean campus to show them some practice oriented lessons on how they can use their skills from the classroom in a, in a real environment, such as the former Yugoslavia and the Balkans wars that took place. Anyway, the I hope though that the start of the conversation about the Korean Peninsula and the East Asia and what's going on here will help us uh, learn to uh, work together for greater peace and security in the Korean Peninsula and the greater region, and maybe let, make us a little better at understanding the world as we know it. So first of all, a little bit more about me. Uh, first, I was a Marine for 21 years. Uh, US Marine, I traveled throughout the world, had many different jobs. And then after I finished my Marine Corps career, I spent about eight and a half years, almost nine years as a government service worker working for the federal government. And also I'm a first generation scholar. And then as um, Robert Matt said earlier, I now uh, we have the Peace and Conflict Studies Center here and I also uh, coordinate for the program here in South Korea. Totally, I have about 35 years of experience in conflicts, mediation, negotiation, security, and of course, intelligence issues for the US government. In my former life, I was also the chief of the Indo-Pacific Division for the Marine Corps Intelligence Activity. So certainly, I know a little bit about the greater region here. I've been living off and on in Korea for about 25 years, and that includes living in uh, Japan for about 12 years. And then finally, I've traveled to many conflict areas around the world to include North Korea. So a little bit about conflict now as a relation perspective. Uh, and what we're trying to do here for the purpose today. And that is, of course, to teach you about what we call protracted social conflict, to provide a little deeper understanding of North and South Korea in the context of regional players, to promote alternate ways to transform the relationship and eventually resolve the conflict in order to peacefully unify the peninsula uh, and have more peace within the region. And finally, to provide recommendations to help manage or transform or resolve the security issues we have in the region itself. So a car-centric perspective, what is that? The first of all, you, you, we need to have a better understanding of what conflict knowledge of resolution is all about. It's a really, it's a hybrid discipline. It's made up and informed by many other disciplines around the world. We take the best parts of other disciplines and we try to apply it in a different way to see the world. And of course, as you see on the slide, that it includes the disciplines of peace studies, law, history, political science, diplomacy, anthropology, sociology, psychology, and many, many more. We also try to understand, transform, and either manage or peacefully resolve the difficult issues we have at all levels of society, from individual issues in the household to issues maybe students have in school to business issues uh, and management within companies, all the way up to international conflicts. Really, the, the basic is what we do is we try to consider that all parties are unique in their positions, and they all have interest in basic human needs that has to be addressed. We also understand that conflicts are dynamic, and thus efforts, all of our efforts combined to resolve them must also be dynamic in how we look at it. 
we know that in order to build lasting positive peace, it takes years of work. In fact, some scholars talk about generational change. And we also see that in the former, uh, the East and West Germany. We attempt to take out any personal biases we have because we all have, we're all human, we all have personal biases. So when we look at trying to resolve or mediate or, or mitigate a conflict, we wanna do so from a neutral position, even though we may have our own certain feelings on that conflict. And finally, we seek to be what's considered preventive. Preventive is a unique word we use within the field that means a combination of being proactive and preventive. If we were all preventive in nature, I think that many of the issues we have today, both within our own country and abroad, may be uh, resolved before they even get started. So now let's talk about a couple of terms and theories that I think may help you understand uh, how I'm presenting today. So some key terms we talk about is manage. So when we talk about managing conflict, what we're trying to do is take something that's already relatively positive, uh, whether it be relationship or whether it be international relations in general, and we're trying to manage that relationship in general. Now, if the relationship isn't very good, then we wanna to try to transform that relationship or that conflict into something that's more positive in nature. Then finally, you see on the screen, it says resolve the conflict or the challenge. Now that's the most difficult thing to do because how do we know when a conflict is really resolved? A conflict anywhere in any place can reoccur at any time, but it's a continuous process, what I refer to as trying to work on the underlying reasons of the deep roots of the conflict on a day-to-day -day basis in order to live peacefully and to prevent other things from occurring in the future. Next, if we talk about a few key theories, I mentioned protective social conflicts earlier. I think it has a little bit of uh, importance for you to understand. First of all, protective social conflicts is just a, 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 a a theory made up to try to explain how conflicts can be occurring for a long period of time, maybe not at the surface as in an international conflict or war, but at the subsurface. So it has the deep roots uh, that are getting further and further in the ground. And of course, relationships are strained and the conflict becomes frozen. Now, when you have a protracted social conflict, you normally have four preconditions. You have communal content of society. And the communal content of society just means the people themselves. What have they been through? Was it a former colony of, of another country? Was it uh, taken over or was it in conflict before? So what are the people doing and how are they living now? Then it connected with that is the basic human needs of society. What do they need in order to, not only to survive or exist, but to be better and have what we call social mobility in life? Next is we call, we call it the state's role. So the structure the state provides to its citizens. Now, in a protective social conflict, that structure is normally referred to as structural violence because the structure doesn't support the citizens. It actually puts down the students or keeps them in place. Finally, international linkages. With any conflict around the world, there's always other players. We can see with Ukraine today, whether we have NATO and other countries assisting Ukraine, and we have other countries assisting Russia, India, uh, to China to a lesser extent and other countries as well. And we just read in the news probably today uh, that Iran is maybe assisting Russia with drones and other things. So these are the four preconditions and I think they match what's happening in Korean Peninsula right now. Next, we have what's called autistic hostility. Autistic hostility is just a, a great theory that talks about the breaking of the contact. We know that when people are not in con contact with another or countries, their views of each other become very rigid and you think the worst of the other. So this autistic hostility over time makes the two parties or the two countries or multiple countries think the worst about the other and therefore they become a threat. With that, there's also positioning theory. We never like to think of the other when we think of, of our position as a nation or individual. And so when you have positioning theory, you just don't wanna think about your own position but about the other position, the position of the other party or parties as well. Additionally, we have contact theory. Now, I just mentioned autistic hostility. Contact theory is a great way to say, hey, look, if we don't have contact with one another, we have the autistic hostility, how then can we become uh, lesser threats to each other and eventually maybe become uh, friends or allies? So this contact theory explains that if you have more contact over a long period of time, and if the contact is positive in nature, then the perception of others may change, the perception of nations may change. And then of course, this reduces prejudices and create what we call positive relationships. Now, how do we do this? We normally do this through direct high quality contact. 
an indirect high quality contact. Of course, direct high quality contact is pretty easy to understand. It's the meetings and exchanges we have both at the governmental level and at the individual level of different societies. Now, the indirect to high quality contact, though, is a little bit more complicated. It's anything we can use to influence the other. Sometimes this falls under the form of public diplomacy, but it also includes news events, um, the SNS now, because everybody's on the internet uh, nowadays, and also such things as movies. How are we portraying the other past events, historical events, and even events that we have today? So these theories are very important to us in how we look at trying to resolve the protracted social conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So that's good assumptions. I have a lot of assumptions for you because uh, those that may not be familiar with the side of the world, there's so much going on over here. And I think these assumptions may help you understand it a little bit more. So first of all, the division in, of North and South Korea was really the first test of the Cold War for those of us old enough to remember that. And it's now finally the last symbol of all its ugliness. Uh, Korean Peninsula itself is, holds, I think, the key to greater success in East Asia region. It's a, it's a fledgling democracy over here. It's now ranked, I believe, 12th GDP in the world. So it really has a key role to play within the greater region, but it can't do that unless it's trying to get over what's happening with North Korea and the other players within the region we're going to talk about a bit later. North and South Koreans are originally the same people, so they're not entirely different. They all want to survive. Like all citizens, all people around the world, we all want to survive. We all want to prosper, and we all want to be free to live our lives the way we see it. That's the same for North and South Koreans. Additionally, central government efforts alone, whether it be United States efforts, whether it be South Korean efforts, Japan's efforts or other countries around the world, or even United Nations efforts cannot fully address our work on all the pyramid of issues that involve North and South Korea. It takes a combination of all of us working together to help understand and resolve that. Additionally, uh, North Korea's intent can never be understood. You never know what the other is thinking. Uh, but even though we may not know their intent, even though they may seem hostile to us, it should not prevent our efforts to try to engage them and change the future we have with them. Additionally, as I said earlier, the Korean Peninsula is a protective social conflict. The parties are not looking at trying to understand each other or the basic human needs. And that's really the, the essence of what we are today. You know, we look at ourselves and our needs for our family or a group, in this, in this case, South Koreans, look at their, their needs as a country. In the United States, we do the same. So it's hard to look at the other's basic needs. Additionally, when you look at the parties and when they interact with North Korea, it's almost always these one-off negotiations or some of the meetings we may have with North Korea or other parties. And it's not really a, a consistent long-term engagement that we really need to have. Uh, additionally, it's hard to resolve something uh, as deep-rooted as the, the conflict with North Korea, uh, the end of the Cold War, in just a few days. It takes decades of change to make it work. So a few meetings or a few days, uh, or even such things as a peace treaty, will not change uh, the differences between North and South Korea, or the United States and, and North Korea, for that matter. In other words, it will take decades to really make change happen in North Korea, and even for South Koreans to change, because it's a relationship that has to be built between North and South Korea. Some other assumptions is that the histories, cultures, and identities, and even languages uh, are not that different. However, there are some differences when you, even if it's it may be similar to British English and US English, but there are differences. And so therefore we have to understand what those differences are and try to start to bridge those differences. North and South Koreans have a very different perception of who the we are, whether it's be individual or collectivistic in societies that we see today. Businesses and economic development can be an important role uh, to help coexist in integration of societies. We all know that even if the wall, the proverbial wall between North and South Korea, the DMZ as we call it, came down tomorrow, we need a lot of assistance to try to change the infrastructure and everything going on in North Korea. And I think businesses, NGOs, and others can be a great support for that. Education, how education is taught, and the reconciliation of education systems between uh, two different parties are very important for us to eventually look at. Trauma. Trauma, we don't really talk about very often, but the trauma from past wars, whether it be a war 70 years ago or a war yesterday, 
the trauma that citizens hold and the grudges because of that trauma against the other are very vivid in people's minds, even if it's been passed down from an earlier generation to an older generation, from an older generation to a younger generation. So therefore, we must look at the trauma that's going on uh, in the Korean Peninsula if we're going to look at trying to resolve the issues there. Faith-based organizations can help North Korea. It can help the, the unification of the peace process. Why do I say this? Uh, I say this because right now North Korea has a very strict system under the, the Kim regime. So therefore, they do not have the concept of, of a different type of, of assistance or help or community feeling. Uh, it's been replaced by ideological uh, pushing from the regime down. So therefore, when they cut, we see the North Koreans, when they come down to South Korea, they are pretty much lost in the beginning because they don't have that structure that was pushed on them from the top down. So therefore, when uh, religious organizations help these uh, North Korean diaspora that comes down in South Korea and others, and even when we go up, it was in the 1990s to assist North Korea during the floods, the tragic floods in the 1990s, we've seen that the, the ability of faith-based organizations to reach out and to help the North Koreans was very important to us. German unification model. Everyone likes to talk about the German unification model and how it may be great for South and North Korea. However, we gotta be very careful with that. It's a different society, a different era, a different culture, and of course, uh, differences in how they fought their wars against one another. And of course, East and West Germany never went to war as well. We have to make sure we think of transitional justice issues as we go forward. And then of course, the peace process itself uh, is going to take a long time. And we have to get politicians, governments, and all these programs put together. We also need to look at the 30,000 or more North Koreans, the diaspora that's already escaped from North Korea, and how can they exist? In, how can they help us learn how to coexist with the other and be the future leaders that we may need? Outsiders can't change governments. I put this on the screen because whenever I do talks about conflicts and war, we always want to talk about changing regimes. And quite frankly, we're not very good at that. Uh, if we try to forcefully change a regime or change a government, to make it more friendly toward his own people or toward another government, we're going to fail. At the end of the day, it has to be the North Koreans that want to make change into the North Korean society and change their own way of government. Sanctions, I'm not a fan of. Sanctions for a short period of time have great effect on a society to try to, to force them to move into something that may be better. But sanctions over 70 years have very little effect because a regimes like North Korea has learned how to go around those sanctions and then at the end of the day, those same sanctions are supposed to, to prevent the regime from doing things such as for, uh, building uh, weapons, mass destruction, long range missiles, they do it anyway. And then at the end of the day, the sanctions itself only hurt the North Korean citizens. And then the, the North Korean regime can blame the West, the United States and South Korea for the citizens not being able to have anything to eat. See, it's not our fault, it's their fault. They have sanctions on us. So we have to be very careful about using sanctions. Uh, the most important point on the slide, though, is to treat the symptom. Uh, the, certainly, when we look at North Korea and the issues within the region, we want to try to treat the symptom instead of the disease. And of course, the disease is a conflict. Why did it happen and how can we resolve the conflict? But instead, we look at such things as nuclear weapons, missiles. Of course, they're very important. And we do not want any country, especially a rogue country or a dangerous country with North Korea, to have nuclear weapons. However, if we just look at nuclear weapons, we can't get past that, then how can we look at the deep-rooted issues that cause the conflicts? So we must be broader in how we look at it and how we treat it in order to get to the disease itself. Peace treaties are great, but peace treaties when it comes to the Korean Peninsula would not change North Korea at all. We could sign a, a contract or a peace treaty tomorrow, you would still have a DMZ, you would still have a North Korean military, a South Korean military, and of course, US troops stationed in South Korea. Speaking of the US, uh, the Rock Alliance, the, even if the, there was unification in the future because of other dynamics within the region to include China and others, uh, the, there's gonna be a need for US and Rock Alliance to continue and for probably for US uh, troops uh, and assistance to be within the region itself. So different views, I'm gonna go through some of these different views a little bit quickly. So therefore you can see uh, what's going on and we can go on about it from there. 
So let's talk about U.S. view. We're going to talk about the U.S. citizen views and the U.S. Um, the government view of North Korea, and then we're going to do the same thing for South Korea. I think that's important for us to get that total understanding of what's going on. And of course, if we talk about the U.S. citizens view in North Korea. Unfortunately, I think that there's very little or a narrow view of what North Korea is even about. In fact, when we look at our young, we probably could ask them to point to North Korea on a map and they wouldn't know where to point to it. So there's a, there's a, a lack of understanding uh, and even the history that involves the Korean Peninsula and the Korean War. The exception to that, of course, is the older generations where their fathers or grandparents or grandfathers may have participated in the Korean War. And then, of course, those that are concerned with what's happening here today. Uh, then there's also a little concern about uh, North Korea because of the domestic policies in the United States. Citizens in general in every country, they're not as concerned about the outside world as much as they are about their own uh, house, so to speak. So therefore, because of what's going on in the United States and others, they're more concerned about domestic politics than anything else. The COVID has really paralyzed the world. Not only has it paralyzed the United States, but it's also paralyzed any attempt for us to build our knowledge uh, on other countries around the world and try to uh, understand it better. Of course, occasionally the United States and its citizens learn a little bit about North Korea uh, and the defectors because when they come out, they speak about the horrors that happened within North Korea itself. Then, of course, uh, most are unaware of the need for peace or even if there wasn't a peace treaty within North and South Korea. They believe it's just North and South Korea now. And there's no conflict happening at the time. Now, of course, the U.S. citizen view of South Korea is a bit more robust. It's robust because of all the great things happening within South Korea, the relationships between North and South Korea at the government level and also the people level. Uh, the you know There's an increase in, in popularity of South Korean products in the United States. South Korean food is very healthy. Uh, the euphoria over South Korean K-pop for the younger generations, BTS and Blackpink, for example. Also, there's been great Korean films that bro broke into U.S. markets and on Netflix and others. You can see great movies like Parasite, Minati, the dramas, the Squid Games, and others. So actually, the it's, it's a form of public diplomacy. The South Korean has been very good at, at selling uh, their products and their image to the world, and, and the United States is no difference for that. Of course, before COVID, uh, there was a lot of travel to South Korea, not just of former uh, relatives of uh, veterans of the Korean War and others, but South Korea is just a great place to visit. It's dynamic. It has uh, modern cities, modern transportation, and a lot of great things to do. Additionally, when you look at South Korea, we know that it's a, a, a real accomplished uh, democracy within East Asia. It's really a, a one high point of all the ugliness in the world. Of all the past wars, we see just like the end of the, the World War II, and we've seen the rebuilding of Europe and the great democracies within Europe. We see that within Asia now, within uh, South Korea, and also Japan. So, therefore, it's really a great accomplishment that we should all be proud of. Now, the U.S. government's view of North Korea, uh, of course, the U.S. government is, is probably more than frustrated with North Korea. Uh, they know that it remains the last relic of the, the Cold War. They're frustrated over the defiance of international norms, the development, the continued development and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, the human rights violations that go on on a daily basis within North Korea. And so therefore it's at the forefront of many aspects of the US foreign policy within East Asia. But let's look at how government officials think, the experts think of North Korea. And that of course is what we consider in the, in the IR field, the hawks and doves. And we know that the majority of the hawks within the, the US sphere at least are traditionally advocated for more sanctions, isolationism, and even potential use of military force or power to bring North Korea into compliance and in how uh, they deal with us in the world as we see it. Now the minority or doves look at the other way. How can we be better at trying to engage them in certain ways? So you have the hawks and the doves, but there's also another problem when it comes to looking at uh, North and South Korea and the overall problem within the Korean Peninsula. And that is, of course, what we consider the Washington DC Beltway Dilemma. As we know, the Washington DC has a beltway around it. And when we refer to that, what we're saying is that the, there's not a lot of great new ideas or initiatives to come out of the Beltway or Washington DC proper. 
normally is a recycling of different ideas in the past. So we go through this pendulum of left and right on policies when it comes to North Korea and within the region, but there's no new policies or initiatives that really want to change the dynamics themselves. And that's unfortunate as we know. And of course, we know just like everything else, the US government is concerned about economics more than peace at the moment. Now, the US government's view of South Korea is excellent. Uh, you know, as we said earlier, it's a, it's a highlight of, of past wars and the ability to help uh, defend nations uh, for a greater peace and democracy. So we understand that. Uh, and it's been over seven decades of relationships with South Korea. We also recognize that South Korea has a larger role to play within the greater region. And with the military alliance in general, including Japan, we know that it can help hold the line and prevent provocation, not just from North Korea, but the expansion of, unfortunately, that ugly word communism within the greater region again. Of course, though, the United States is a little bit frustrated at South Korea over times and it stands with China. But with a new government here in South Korea, we see that a lot of that's changing now for the good. And there's also a concern, unfortunately, like most countries around the world, excuse me while I take a drink of water, please, is that there's, there's a frustration uh, with how history within the region and even between two democracies like uh, South Korea and Japan has prevented these two leading democracies within the region, leading GDPs and, and, and governments as well, to try to get together and work together for a greater good with the region. Uh, so these, this frustration of the historical and territorial disputes between Japan and uh, South Korea uh, really needs to start to be resolved to be, uh, become a better, more solid um, the alliance within the region itself. Uh, again, though, generally there's a positive piece for process unification, but through a different lens and how we see it. So let's talk about challenges now. There's a lot of challenges, as we know. Because of 70 years of division, there's a lot of, not a lot of trust between North and South Korea perspectives, that autistic hostility that I referred to earlier. So therefore, there hasn't been a lot of consistent contact neither. As we said, you know, we had, for the first time ever, we had a U.S. sitting president, President Trump, that met with Kim, the Kim, uh, the younger Kim on uh, three occasions. And of course, nothing was, uh, nothing occurred from that. However, the, the great thing about that is at least we met and we started that process. And I think if we continue to do that, uh, those dynamic efforts of trying to engage with North Korea is gonna be better off for us. So challenges, again, because it's deep rooted challenges, we have to be able to address them at multi-level society. We have to look at, they're not being little, there's little consistency right now trying to have that positive contact to refer to earlier or to break down the biases and the hatred or the perceived hatred we have the other. Also, there's an increasing gap between the culture, language, and understanding of human rights and human thought and will even between the two Koreas. Also, there were worlds apart when it comes to economic and ideological differences between North and South Korea. It was going to take really generations to overcome. You know, in the former East Germany, after it was reunified, the former uh, mayor of Bonn came out about 15 years ago and he said, I really thought by now we would be completely one society. However, it's gonna take at least another one or two generations for all the differences between East and West Germany to really work itself out to become one country all again. Uh, the same goes for North and South Korea. They've been divided for 70 years. So therefore we need a lot of time to work through all the differences. There has to be generational change, a little bit at a time through great education. So also we have the other things happening within the region that greatly affects the Korean Peninsula. We have China. China, of course, is a growing power and it has growing needs because of that power. We're concerned about the rapid growth and the provocations that China has within the region, not just with Taiwan, but also in the South China Sea. We see that China tries to prevent free navigation in the South China Sea. They're building man-made islands in areas that was not theirs, it should not be there. There's also concerns over their economic blackmail. China's put a lot of money into small Asian countries within the region, and they do that in order to bully them and also force them to compliance. And we've seen that happen time and time again. Also, China is trying to exploit other countries' fisheries and natural resources for their own benefits. Uh, of course, uh, we have to mention human rights uh, within China. There's many, many ethnic minority groups within China that has been um, the 
uh, their human rights has been violated on everyday occurrences, whether you went to other the uh, we, we we talk about Tibet or other the other regions within it. But of course, China has some uh, huge human rights issues that has to be looked at. We're also concerned about not just history of China, but how China is trying to change the history of the region by re-identifying other places as being their own historically. So therefore, they believe it should be theirs now. Then, of course, China's growing relationship with Russia further threatens this peacefulness, this, this great alliance we have going on within the region itself. Referring to Russia, we have to be very careful because Russia now, with their, their war going on in Ukraine, we can see them being more uh, territorial in nature and maybe reach out and want more of the Japan, Northern Islands, but they, had, they took after the end of World War II, or the spillover from the war in Ukraine to this area of the world. So we have to be concerned about those. So, you know, we talk about challenges in the Korean Peninsula. Everybody wants to talk about nuclear weapons. But quite frankly, North Korea is not going to get rid of nuclear weapons anytime soon. It doesn't matter what we do to them, what more sanctions or more carrots or more sticks. It doesn't really make a difference because once North Korea has got the taste of the ability to, to be a, a global player on the market and trying to get others to recognize them as a country, uh, this is a great tool for them to do so. It's a terrible tool. It's a dangerous tool. I wish that it wasn't true, but I do not see North Korea ever giving up nuclear weapons under the current regime or the long-range uh, missile development that they have going on today. It's going to take resolving the conflict within North and South Korea and a change of regime in North Korea eventually through the North Korean people to really get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons and its ambitions in other areas around the world. So therefore, the prospects of unification of the two Koreas are not going to be anything soon. Unfortunately, it's going to take a long time. We need to look at harmony first and then look at try to how to uh, eventually resolve and transform the relationship and then unification may happen. I refer to it to when I speak to North and South Korean audience, I talk about the dating game. Uh, you can't marry somebody. You could, I guess, uh, but you need to date the other in order to get to know them again, in order to have the relationship and reunify or to marry, uh, as we say, uh, to become one family again, the North and South Koreans I'm referring to. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm not a fan of sanctions. I think sanctions are not working. We need to retailer them, shorten them up, and try to do other types of incentives and um, efforts to try to prevent them from having uh, more uh, weapons or more technology that may be used for other means outside of peaceful means itself. Recent US mistakes, I have to be honest with you that the, the United States government, uh, the, you know, we're, we're always an experiment, our democracy is, and therefore we make mistakes. Unfortunately, we don't always learn from those mistakes. And our, our broken promises in the past to different countries around the world, some of the issues we've had in, in uh, the Middle East, for example, more recent with Afghanistan, before that Libya, uh, our, our half efforts in Syria and others, it doesn't really hold well for other countries in the world that depends on us to be the leader of the world. So we have to try to learn from those mistakes and not be uh, repeating them over and over again as we see that go. Uh, we have the legacies and history, as I said earlier. We have to start working at the academic level and the people level to try to understand different regions, different countries and cultures and histories and try to work on a history that encompasses the views of everybody within the region itself. And then, of course, the I have to say that United States, uh, the we're overextended within the world itself. We have a lot going on within Ukraine uh, and Europe right now. We're trying to look at other areas of the world. This is not always bad, but we have to be honest with ourselves. It's hard for us to be everywhere at one time. So we are overextended despite the Asia-Pacific strategy, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, rather, as it's called now. So therefore, we have to use uh, the assistance and the teamwork of other regional players and other democracies to try to uh, harness the collective power of all of us to keep peace within the region and really peace within the world. However, when we look at the security dilemma, as we know, security dilemma really means that I'm, I'm afraid of the other, so therefore, they may be building weapons. I want to build more weapons. And I, I fear that if we're not careful in how we try to get Japan and South Korea and other democracies to try to, to um, 
become stronger, more independent. We're going to have better. We're going to have more issues because then the other, meaning North Korea, maybe China, and others in the region may look at it as a threat. So this tit for tat, building more weapons and more weapons, can be very dangerous. We have to make sure that the the democracies within the region are trying to be strong, but not be a, a such a, a risk that it, it creates an arm race within the region itself. So recommendations. Finally, we're recommendations. So the first ones are more military related because I think they're important to really discuss for a moment. And hopefully we'll have some good questions at the end of it. That we look at joint military or combined relationships and exercises to include naval exercises in South Korea and Japan. We haven't done a lot of that, uh, not only the last two years, but really the last 10 years per se. A lot of that has to do with relationships, COVID as we know during the last two years, uh, governments not wanting to provoke North Korea, so they want to do less uh, military exercises, but it's necessary in order to maintain readiness. Uh, South Korean readiness right now is not very good because last five years of the former uh, presidency, they weren't really looking at uh, at the readiness of this military forces. They're looking at trying to reach out and sometimes, unfortunately, appease North Korea. So that's been dangerous. We need to get back to regular exercises, not as an offensive means, but as a defensive means to show that we have strength, we have uh, readiness in order to combat against anything that may come our way. We have to assist uh, the regions within it. I said, I, I talked about the arms race earlier. Of course, we don't want an arms race, but we want to make sure that the democracies within the region are well trained and of course they're well equipped. So we have to assist them uh, and, and make sure that they're uh, well trained in a way uh, and they have the strength and the arms that they have. The uh, in the military we use the term, the term multi-domain anti-access anti-denial. So those are just the you've seen on the news maybe with Ukraine the missiles they're using to try to combat with Ukraine. So we need to help the region here also develop uh, that type of capabilities to protect its coastal areas and also protect its airways as we see it. Uh, in addition is you know the uh, uh, you may be aware that Israel has a great iron dome system that protects from incoming missiles. I, I would like to see the development of that within the region as well. And of course, uh, at the military level, there was, a, there was an intelligence sharing agreement between the United States, South Korea, and Japan that was kind of scuttled or throw or, or, or stopped a couple of years ago because, again, the differences in historical events and the problems between relationships between Japan and South Korea. We need to restart that to have a strong a sharing agreement. We need to work with our allies. The problems that we have in the world today also deal with food and economic and even energy security. We have to be able to diversify energy security, food security, uh, and economic security in order for these smaller uh, countries like Japan and South Korea to become less independent uh, from China and others within the region. The primary security for your nation always deals with energy, independency, food, and of course, economic uh, dependency as well. So we have to make sure we try to work on that. Even the United States needs to work on energy dependency and food security, by the way. We need to continue to put dynamic types of alternative forms of direct dynamic types of um, change or try to attempt dynamic change within North Korea by this indirect and direct contact that I referred to earlier, not just at the government level, but at the people level as well. There is no reason why we can't have exchanges with North Korean students, or with others, for them to see what the outside world is all, all about. And I believe that's very important for us to do. Also, we have to allow regions, regional allies, especially South Korea, to take the lead in many of the of the North Korean uh, issues that we have today. Uh, in an earlier slide, uh, the we didn't go really go into detail, but sometimes South Korea has been frustrated with the uh, United States um, overhanded uh, overhandedness with the issues within the Korean Peninsula. And we need to really let South Korea come to its own way now and start to lead in many of the problems that they have, and then we can be the support that they may need. Also, we need to invite others from outside the region to be involved within it. I believe that there's a lot of great things happening within NATO, for example, the United Nations that can be used within the greater area to help with such things as maritime security issues and also the economic and food independent, the dependency that we should have within the region itself. But we also need to strengthen our public diplomacy. Uh, you know, the public diplomacy, which was really created the term anyway in the United States a long time ago, we haven't done the public diplomacy like we used to. We need to re-energize re that, 
remake it and try to have great public diplomacy with other nations around the world and with the United States. So some other recommendations is uh, the, uh, you may have heard of what the Quad and ASEAN is. There's two different organizations here within uh, just two of many organizations within Asia. We need to, to have the Quad and ASEAN strengthen its uh, alliances and work similar to what NATO and the EU does. We need to be more preventive, as I said earlier, and strengthen alliances. And we need to create opportunities to work for the betterment of human life uh, within the region itself. We have to understand that conflict are dynamic and complex. I said earlier that we, we have to, we were a hybrid discipline. So therefore, the efforts we do to try to help others, we need to do that in a dynamic and complex way. So in other words, because conflicts and social issues and even government issues, <clears throat> excuse me, are very complex, we have to be just as complex and dynamic to try to, to change that in a positive way. We can't use aid, though, as a foreign policy pool, tool. You know, aid is supposed to be a form of, uh, it is a form of soft power sometimes, but aid, the assistance we give to others, uh, should be just that. It should be in the form of aid because just that, that ability for us to assist others is going to help uh, many people around the world and have a better image of what the United States may be. Also, we need to diverse and positive and sustained contact. Um, we used to have, I believe it might be on another slide, but we used to have a very robust, and we still have uh, a robust program uh, trying to bring other countries' citizens the United States to study under the full Fulbright program. But we can do that also with North Korea uh, because the positive change that can happen from them being out of their country through a Fulbright type programs can really assist us. Uh, the, this pyramid here is on the show, just to show you that we have to understand that if we're going to work with countries, it just can't be from the top down. It has to be top, bottom up, and top down. We have to look at the, the, the width of society and try to get everybody involved and just not make it a government effort to try to resolve different issues we may have, not just in North and South Korea or the Korean Peninsula, but every country around the world. We have to understand that we're a, a, we are nations of peoples and businesses and NGOs and governments, we had to all work together to make that better. Uh, engagement, engagement, engagement. I can't tell you that just as, just the full the full bright I said earlier, but also the engagement, our ability to engage the other, to stop that autistic hostility is very important. So how do we do that? You know, even during the the ugly days of the Cold War, when the really the former Soviet Union had the ability to strike out, and we had we could have nuclear war, and the, the world could have been destroyed. We still had embassies and, and, and consulates throughout the Soviet Union and the satellite countries they had within the former Soviet Union. So we had that then, and it was a great tool for that, that unofficial dialogue we needed in order to try to keep tensions from rising to the point of war. And many of those embassies and, and different sites around the world helped us work with uh, the former Soviet Union to bring down the wall and start to create a more peaceful society. So we need to do that with every country, just because they're a potential threat or they may be an enemy. If we don't have those embassies or cultural centers or some way to interact on a daily basis with them, then how can we have the high quality contact that we may need? And of course, more academic conferences and workshops, such as the, the uh, Puk Watch conferences we have to try to bring in North Korea and show them there's a better way to do it. Education and culture exchange, we already uh, referred to a lot. But what I want to also focus on is uh, the ability of uh, such things as sports diplomacy. You may have heard it from Dr. So Young Wan earlier in one of her presentations. Sports diplomacy, fine arts, everything uh, in the, the non-threatening modes of engagement really helps people understand each other. We start to bridge cultural differences, ideological understandings, and we say that, well, we're just the same people. We can be one and understand one another very well. Diaspora and capacity building. As I said earlier, we have over 30,000 former North Korean diaspora around the world. We don't do a very good job of using the, the, these North Koreans, former North Koreans, to try to not only use their knowledge, but also build them as, as great future leaders for whatever the, the Korean peninsula may look like in the future. We need to do so, though, if we're going to have the, the, the toolbox of knowledge and skills in order to go forward in the future. And of course, like everything else, I can't say it more times than ever is, we have to be better at combining all these efforts together. Too many times 
governments try just one or two approaches to, to, to deal with, resolve, or transform a conflict. It takes multiple efforts happening simultaneously to see which ones may work in kind of a building block format to try to help resolve these difficult issues we have around the world. And again, it takes decades of change. Uh, just as the former Bond mayor said, and just as many other leaders and academics and great scholars such as John Paul Lederach has said, it's generational change. It has to be changed by us teaching the young uh, to get rid of the mistrust and to start to trust one another again. So also, the I want to say one other thing, and that's about zones of peace and cities of peace. Normally, when we look at we have a DMZ between North and South Korea. We have other areas, former military bases that are no longer used. If we could create or establish zones and cities of peace and even peace parks, it may look as a tool to bring these two sides together in a non-threatening way. It can be a synergy to enhance this positive contact we may need, to have the exchanges we may need to get them together. So I would recommend that we need to have, not just in North and South Korea, by the way, we need to have more zones and cities of peace and peace parks to help uh, different sides get together and work on difficult problems together. Public diplomacy, again, is very important. We have to really increase our public diplomacy around the world. As we know, you see there's a problem uh, with Confucius centers. The Chinese has put a lot of money into public diplomacy, a lot of money, period, in different countries. Uh, the, we cannot allow others to use uh, maybe unfactual or public diplomacy that are interfering with our efforts to be uh, world leaders and have democracies around the world. So we have to increase our public diplomacy. We need to retool it. We need to look at other countries and have the interaction uh, and assistance we, we need uh, to help others around the world. So the final thoughts, the, uh, and then we're gonna have time, I believe, I don't know the time, the, I have a full screen going on here, so I don't see the time. But so some final thoughts is that the Korean Peninsula, what's happening within Asia, uh, within the region can change. It can be transformed for the better. It really can. I, I, I've seen the greatness within South Korea. And, and we, if you look at South Korea 20, 30 years ago, it was just as poor, if not poor, than North Korea was. So we know that, the Korean Peninsula in general, North and South Korea can change and they can come back together again. But we have to work on it collectively together to try to resolve the protracted social conflicts and work on what's needed for the citizens of these countries and not for our own personal or our the institutional uh, objectives that we may have. Well, also, we can't forget about human rights. Too many times we put human rights, we talk about human rights, everywhere. United States, we talk about human rights violations in other countries. The United Nations talk about uh, human rights everywhere. But when it comes to human rights and social justice, at the day-to-day, -day, we kind of put it on the back burner if it doesn't fit how we're trying to change or what we're trying to do within the day itself. Our political efforts to affect change must also include human rights and social justice. If we don't do that, then all we're doing is changing one regime that may be bad into another bad regime. We're not looking at the people and how to affect them or help them. And so that's very important for us to do. And of course, everybody talks about, um, well, if you engage, you can't have a strong military because that's threatening in nature. That's not. The engagement and exchange doesn't mean less security or defense. There's no such thing as blind trust in the world as we know today. And in fact, I would rather see um, a strong defense to show that if if the if North Korea or other potentially belligerent countries came in the world and tried to uh, do something uh, negative or try to um, enforce change on other countries in a bad way, that we're here to, to not only protect those countries, but have this, the means to do so. So blind trust should never be the way. So with that, Mike, I think I'm going to turn it over to you with some, I see there's some questions, I guess, and we can try to answer those. Mike, are you with me? Uh, yes, sir. If uh, you could uh, go ahead and stop your share, you can go back to uh, full screen uh, of viewing and then uh, open the Q&A and you can see the questions okay. there. Okay, I see one from Noah. So let me read it out loud for everybody in case they don't see it. And maybe we can work on it uh, together. So Noah asked, 
In order to reach any kind of agreement, you need two willing partners. Absolutely. I fully agree with you. What would the Kim regime, which currently has absolute power, hope to gain from any agreement? Well, the that's a great question. I, the, I wish I had a crystal ball, but to me, in my humble opinion, the you you can't you cannot entice a foreign leader or a country to change. So therefore, any agreement that must be made with North Korea has to first recognize that the North Korean government is a sovereign government. Whether we like the government or not, it's there and it's sovereign. So therefore, if we want to engage with North Korea and the regime and, and uh, the the the, uh, the younger Kim, we must first recognize that you are you are the leader of your country, whether we like it or not. So then when we do that, we can start to work on an, an agreement that may be uh, beneficial for him or for the country and also beneficial for South Korea as well. Absolute power is always a problem. When you have it, you don't want to get rid of it. And in North Korea, that's also a problem because the the the, the three Kims, the grandfather, the father, and now Kim Jong-un, They've had such a, a tailored way of pushing down the structural violence in society that they really can't, the, the people can't even want change. They can't even look at change. We talk about deprivation and how deprivation of basic human needs can prevent people from even doing the most basic things. And when you have countries that are people within North Korea that can't even think about the next meal, then you certainly can't expect them to rise up and say, we want the Kim regime out of power. So therefore, we whatever the agreements are going to be in the future, we have to try to first recognize that Kim's a leader, whether we like him or not, and deal with him on a state-to-state -state level, and then the people-to-people -people level as well. So I hope that kind of helps you uh, in the understanding. And hopefully, together, collectively, we can look at uh, what could be a better agreement uh, for the two Koreas itself. So let's go on to Phil. So Phil asked the question, there's also a challenge for Japan, who claims that they own the Dokdu Islands, uh, which is, of course, South Koreans currently control. Uh, Phil, earlier in the presentation, I talked about the historical and the territory issues, and of course, that's an issue. The Any country that that owned or believed that they possessed land in, in the past, whether for good or bad reasons, they, they never liked to say, that's not mine anymore. Whether it be, if we look at Japan and in general, if we look at Japan and their Northern Islands, which was seized by the, uh, by the Russians at the end of World War II, uh, then of course they want those islands back. They were the Japanese islands at one time. And then when, when it comes to the Korean Peninsula, Part of the problem with the recognition that Dokdo is a South Korean uh, territory is our inability to include South Koreans when we had the, uh, the agreements we made uh, in San Francisco in the 1950s, I believe it was. So therefore, we, the United States, also made some key mistakes in when we had our agreements with the Japanese and others and um, how uh, South Korea was now a sovereign nation again. So yes, absolutely, I agree with you. Dokdo Island, or the little island change there, is a South Korean island, and all the historical records show that it goes back further than any Japanese claim to those islands itself. But let's be frank with one another. Um, the, there are, all, are other areas that are always going to be contentious in trading, but if we're going to if we're going to get over that, we have to get over that step by step. We have to do that by coming together as partners first, and talk about these other things as going on. There's also the problem with Japan over the Japanese uh, sex slave issues, Miyambu, as they used to be called, which I don't like that name, uh, the comfort women, rather. But, you know, these are all historical issues that need to be resolved, but we need to work together on them, and I think we can. Uh, Japan is not going to try to take Doto Island, uh, but you also have to think from Japan's position or point of view. Well, if I say Doto Island is Korea's, which I'm sure that they know it is, then what's Russia going to say when I ask for the, the islands back again? Well, you know, you already said that the Dokdo Island is not yours, so these are not yours any longer now. So there's, I'm sure they have an internal fear of domino effect of losing more territory when they, when they start to give things away. Not give things away, but recognize that they were never there to begin with. So I hope that helps you understand that more. So next question, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know whether I can pronounce his name correctly. Um, Myrna? Uh, Anyway, the question it looks like a great question. What prevents a war? What prevents a war is being ready for the war if it happens? Does that type of thinking lead to arms race? Oh, that's a great question. I think what you're referring to is, is that a strong defense uh, means less war. 
And certainly in all modern countries, less countries are willing to fight with you if you have a strong defense and you're prepared to fight the fight if you need to. And that's the same for the US military or any other country around the world. Can it create arms race? Absolutely. The, however, the way to avoid that is to think of a strong defense not as a way to have that military industrial complex to create more weapons and sell those weapons around the world to start those armed races, but try to just have enough quality and quantity of military men and women in uniform, and of course, the training and equipment they need to be a strong defensive force, and if necessary, an offensive force for the protection of their, not only their country, but the protection of others that they're allies with. So it's very dangerous, but we can certainly try to do that. Um, so, Phil, you have another one, comfort women. Uh, additionally, South Korea is still getting more compensation for comfort women who are dying off fast. This is a big problem between them. Absolutely. The, the comfort women or sex slave issues, as I say again earlier, it's a very sad issue within the history of uh, Japan and Korea and the Japanese occupation in Korea. And yes, there's never many less. I think there's less than maybe 10 now that are left just in South Korea. Of course, there's other comfort women from North Korea and other countries within Asia itself. So the comfort women itself issue is one thing that needs to be uh, resolved. But when I speak to South Koreans and also uh, Japanese, I say this, there's, there's a need for an apology, but there's also a need for acceptance and forgiveness. And so it's a combination of uh, two sides being together. And of course, Japan in their own way, in their own cultural uh, the uh, sensitivities has, has uh, given apologies before. Of course, at the time, the, Jap the uh, South Korean government and South Korean people weren't necessarily ready to accept that uh, and then forgive the, the Japanese for what they did. But I also wanted to say to you, frankly, that we can't continue to punish the current people from the, for the sins of their forefathers. If we do that, we're going to be in a cycle of violence over and over again. We're never going to be the partners and relationships that we need to have in the future. So certainly there is some forgiveness that needs to happen. There's some more apologies that needs to happen. There needs to be re write, rewriting of history books to be more frank about all the things that was done ugly in the past. But that has to be done through relationship building instead of trying to just push one another apart. Uh, Merle, you have another one. Could there be an Asian Eastern formal defensive alliance similar to NATO? Well, certainly there can. I, I would, I'm all for this. I think that the Quad uh, is a great start. Uh, many, even the United States doesn't want the Quad to be expanded out. I believe that the Quad should be expanded out because of more democracies within, re within the region come together in a military alliance, not for offensive capabilities, but for defensive the stronger they're going to be, and then the less reliance they're going to be on us trying to move halfway around the world and support them while we're supporting other areas around the world as well. So certainly it's necessary, and I think it can happen. So Phil, you have another one about former South Korean President Moon. He offered aid and COVID vaccinations to North Korea, but it was rejected. It certainly was rejected. Uh, even aid from China was rejected by uh, North Korea. I think it's um, a matter of pride. You know, Korean people in general are very, Koreans are very, very proud citizens, even though, even North Koreans. And of course, Kim's already told himself as a world leader. So therefore, he, I'm sure in a certain way, doesn't want to show his weakness by saying we need help uh, with COVID vaccinations. I mean, they have, they need help with so many different things to include even tuberculosis. There's such an outbreak of tuberculosis in North Korea that everybody's, so many people are dying. Tuberculosis was wiped out in the United States, but it's so prevalent in North Korea. So they need that aid. They need assistance from the outside world, but it's rejected. It's also rejected because uh, there's nothing else with it. There's not a package deal. The Kim regime, through missiles, through uh, North Korean, uh, through uh, the development of nuclear weapons, uh, through continued the uh, posturing within the area, wants a larger package in order for the Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un to feel he's satisfied so he can show the people what I accomplished, got out of South Koreans and others. So it's unfortunately that he does that. Uh, but again, the way is just to try to offer one thing is try to offer different things without any preconditions for it. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a, just a quick sip of water and we can continue. Marino, you're back again. You say, so has there been, been an application of the contact theory 
and positive conduct approach to U.S. society and polarization? Well, it's quite interesting you say that because the autistic hostility, uh, the it was originally invented to look at black and white relations in the United States. Uh, the so autistic hostility was really about why was there so much differences between the two populations of uh, white Americans and black Americans, and how can we change that? So they saw the autistic hostility, and they turn around and they applied daily contact over a long period of time, positive contact, and they found that the relationships between white Americans and black Americans, and this is 1950s, these experiments happened, really brought US society at a new level of understanding the at least those two groups in that experimental form. Absolutely, we need to do more of that. But we can't, uh, quite frankly, from my personal point of view, we can't have positive contact in the United States if we're trying to then redivide people into different groups uh, and subgroups. And we see that happening today. I know there's good there's good reasoning behind it, but anytime when you try to divide groups up, you're not having that positive contact. You want to try to create not subgroups, but one group of citizens of the United States. And that, of course, is all Americans together. We can't do that by dividing people up and having more autistic hostility and less contact. Uh, so that's a great question. And I hope it's applied more often in the United States as well. Noah, <laughs> you have an economic question. As the economic differences between the two Koreas increase, South Korea becomes increasingly westernized and fewer people are still alive who have memories of Korea before the partition, 1945. Uh, why would it be of interest South Koreans to be unified with North Korea? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, the, when I work with, North, with South Korean uh, students, uh, they actually say the same thing. Why should I sacrifice for North Korea? That, uh, you know, I'm worried about my next, you know, getting a new house, getting married and living a life. I don't want to sacrifice for North Koreans. So that's a huge problem, to be honest. And of course, the uh, back 15, 20 years ago, when the grandparents and parents taught their sons and daughters about the sacrifices they had and the need for North and South Koreans to come together again, that type of historical education and training from the household all the way up to in the school system is not taking place here today. So that's a problem for us. So I think that um, I'm, always a, I'm always an advocate for more history, uh, both at home and in the classroom, uh, not just local history, but world history as well, because it's gonna re-energize what can happen. Now, if you wanna get down to the bare bones of it though, we, South Korea is a prosperous nation, a 12th UDP, uh, GDP right now, I believe. However, that's done at such a hard cost because there's no natural resources hardly in South Korea outside of great mines and hard workers. And so they have to import all these natural resources from other countries around the world. Ironically, the northern part of the Korean Peninsula has almost all the, the natural resources South Korea needs in order to be just as productive and not more. So it makes sense if North and South Korea came to, back together as one country, then they would have all the tools and, and um, resources they need to be a great, powerful country together and be even more prosperous than they are today. So a little bit of sacrifice today is worth a great future, I believe. Okay, Danya. So uh, Danya asks, if we have trouble with democracy here in the States, how are we going to ask for democracy in other countries? I'm with you, Danya. They certainly are. The um, democracy has many different terms. Uh, and there are many different appliances, liberal democracy, democracy as we, we've known in the past. Uh, the I wish I had an answer for you. I believe, though, that the strength of the United States is not for us always being right, but also showing our weaknesses as well. Because if we're frank about our weaknesses and how we're trying to work on those weaknesses, we become stronger in the other eyes. Because nobody wants to see somebody show that they're a world leader, but meaning the United States, not an individual but yet that world leader in the United States isn't doing very well at home. So, but if the world leader is coming out saying, we're willing to help you and we're having our own problems and maybe we should talk about all these problems, I think it makes us a stronger country. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, the, it was probably too fast uh, in general, but I wanted to make sure I get the information out earlier to you so we could have these great questions here today. Thank you though for giving me that um, nice compliment. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Margita. The, uh, um, forgive me if I get your names wrong. 
Is North Korea similar to China, where the children of the elite have great opportunities for education abroad? Absolutely. The North Korea, although recently North Korea uh, sends very little, very few of their children abroad because they use it as a way of ransom or the hostage rather, because it used to be that North Koreans would send their elite abroad to embassies and their families abroad with them. Kim Jong-un was a project, product of that. You know, he grew up in Europe. However, they found out that when they sent entire families abroad, many of them defected or they, they, they escaped uh, the control of North Korea. So what they've started to do recently is they've tailored that and they always make sure at least one or two family members are kept in North Korea. So therefore, the family that may be abroad at a, at a mission at one of the embassies or even with a company that may be working abroad still, uh, they must come back home or they're going to lose their loved ones and maybe let home right now. China's a different story. China's a little bit larger. China likes to send their elite abroad um, the, for two reasons. One, for the education, also because every, uh, how can I say this in a good way? Um, the, the, because China keeps track of other citizens abroad, China uses their citizens or are able to use their citizens if they need to for other than um, positive ways uh, in, in countries that may be abroad. I, I hate to use the word spy, but uh, quite frankly, China is very strong and their ability to manipulate their citizens. And, and uh, so therefore, we have to be very careful. Uh, the, uh, I think Chinese, more Chinese students should be studying abroad in the United States, but I would be careful about what programs you send them to. Uh, don't send them through you know, IT programs, computer programs, uh, things of that nature where they can be used or the information taken back to China and used in a different way. Uh, okay, Elva. Since North Korea has nuclear weapons, my South Korea need to develop bigger weapons to ensure its safety? Wow, this is a loaded question, Alpha. The, uh, we talk about that a lot. And certainly uh, at times there are some uh, hawks within the South Korean government, even Japanese government now, by the way, talks about we need to have nuclear weapons because we need to combat North Korea. Well, quite frankly, that wouldn't do any good. It's not going to combat North Korea. It's not going to create a more peaceful region. And in fact, I would say it does the opposite. North Korea, the, the, we have the nuclear umbrella, the United States does, that's supposed to protect Japan and North Korea and others, so they don't have to develop their own nuclear weapons. North Korea, it would take them hundreds of years to develop enough nuclear weapons to be a threat uh, the, to us, the United States, and therefore a threat to South Korea and uh, Japan, for example. I would submit to you uh, the we should not uh, be... Of course, we can't stop a nation uh, from developing nuclear weapons. We can try. We've done that before, like with North Korea. But most democracies, the I think they understand there's a larger benefit in not having nuclear weapons and having nuclear weapons because there's always the, the, the arms race that comes after that as well. Then again, you also have China that will say, hey, you develop nuclear weapons, we're going to build more, as they're trying to do right now, by the way. Uh, Noah, another follow-up. It would be seen that any economic assistance to North Korea would eventually filter down to the people, which could be a threat to the regime. While possible inducements would make the Kim regime give up the absolute rule of the nuclear power. Hmm. Great question. I'm going to take a sip of water once again. Well, I think uh, economic assistance shouldn't be um, just uh, open the bank door and say, here's what do you need? Just tell me what you need and I'll give it to you. I think economic systems has to be tailored, that it supports the people more than the government. And then when you do so, it, it certainly is going to have a trickle up effect uh, and benefit the regime because the regime becomes more stable. Now, too much assistance to the North Korean people, raising their basic human needs to a level where they feel the need for a change within their government is a danger to the regime. Absolutely. However, if that's done steady over time, then hopefully the, the Kim regime will also see that there is a need for change. You know, if you look at the former Yugoslavia, when Tito came to power, he had a pretty iron fist when he came to the people himself. And then later in life, he became known as a benevolent leader. Now, I'm not saying that Kim would ever be that or we'd want him to ever be that, but there has to be a process. You can't go from a communist nation to a democracy overnight. It takes time to build that a talent and that need or that understanding of why there should be a democracy vice, a socialist republic or vice, a communist nation that it has. Uh, and then the other part of that, will inducements make him give up nuclear weapons? 
again, Kim has no reason to give him nuclear weapons right now. Nobody's going to take them away from him. We know he, he has a pretty good idea that, North, that the United States is not going to attack North Korea because it would be the end of South Korea as well, it would destroy the world economy. It would probably bring China into a war with the United States. So certainly he's pretty safe right now. Uh, so he, he has no reason to give it up. So the worst thing we can do, though, is focus on the nuclear weapons, because the more we focus on nuclear weapons, the more he says, hey, see, I've got these, and this is how much attention I'm getting right now. So be careful. Um, Meryl, the, uh, thank you again. Uh, the, I appreciate you coming on today. I know that we're staying here a bit late as well. Um, so, Melissa, how in general do you believe South Koreans view the North Koreans and their governments? Well, the, I think that South Koreans at the age middle age and maybe the late 30s or 40s up, you know, they certainly have a view uh, that North Korea is dangerous and also that the, there needs to be change within the system of North Korea and the possibility of reunification. You know, there's, as I said earlier, there's an economic reason why a unified Korean peninsula would be so great. And that, by the way, that's why the Chinese are against, uh, in some ways, a united North and South Korea, because it would show strength and a democracy at China's doorsteps now. And then all the subcultures within China and the Northeast region of China uh, that were conquered or are sub subjugated by the Chinese government may seem, hey, well, we see North and South Korea are dependent, and most of our citizens in this area are former North Koreans under a different um, or former Koreans, rather, over, over 100 or a couple hundred years ago. So therefore, they could have problems themselves. So uh, I don't see that um, the uh, the younger North Koreans, uh, South Koreans, changing though until we get more education for them, and they and they understand more about where their brother, their former brothers and sisters were. So education is a key to me, I believe. When, when asked, South Korea would lose so much economically by unification and taking so many uneducated people from North Korea. Uh, Gwen, I have to um, disagree with part of that. I think that the um, right now South Korea has labor shortage, as many countries do, modern countries do. The South Korean birth rate is very low, uh, and so there's not a lot of uh, ability for South Koreans to get labor in unless they bring it from outside the country. Now, I'm not saying that all North Koreans, if there's unification, should be laborers within South Korea. What I'm saying, though, is that there's strength through numbers, there's strength, there's a natural bond, uh, both economically, resource-wise, human resource, and also natural resources that would be better uh, through it. Yes, it's going to be expensive to, to rebuild from scratch North Korea, the road system, the infrastructure, everything that North Korea needs, but it, has, it doesn't have to be done overnight. Remember, just like the United States does whenever there's economic decline, what do they do? They spend money in order to build more road system, do these projects to push money out within the economy. Now, it's not good money, and we see that inflation has happened uh, because of some of that here today. But in the South Korean prospect, it certainly makes more sense to, instead of spending the money for resources above, uh, abroad that leaves your country, instead of bringing in human resources from abroad, that also lessens your money because your money goes out to those countries where they came from because they send them back to their parents and their loved ones back home. It just makes sense over a long period of time to have that collective society in North and South Korea again. So the sacrifice, it may be hard in the beginning, but of course the international community can help with that as well. Okay, uh, Elva, so Kim Jong-un die, who might succeed him? Wow. Um, hopefully not his um, younger sister, but that's probably the only one that I see right now that may be in line for succession if it happens. Uh, but uh, certainly she would not be a very good choice. I don't have any other choice for you. I don't follow the all the elites and uh, uh, nowadays like I used to, but certainly she's probably the one that has the most um, power underneath uh, Kim Jong-un himself. Danya. So Danya says, I wish we had more people like you working. Uh, the, should I read this? I, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Uh, I wish we had more people like you working for our government here in the United States. Unfortunately, most of them tend to use a stick approach. And even though, as you stated, they can see that it hasn't worked, it doesn't work. Makes you wonder why we study history when we don't learn anything from it. <laughs> 
uh, Danya, I'm with you. Unfortunately, I think that although that we don't study history anymore, um, the we should we should learn from mistakes. We should learn to try new ideas, and we should take the ideas that work and try to then multiply them out. But we don't as a country. The look, I'm the those that know me uh, know that of course because I'm military background, I was a Marine. I you know I'm fairly realistic about the world itself, but I also have ideas. So. When people even ask who I am, I talk about myself being an idealistic realist. There's not such a word in the dictionary that I can find. But we have ideals on how to change society, but we have to also deal with society the way it is today in order to have a better tomorrow. Unfortunately, our government is always based on even our democracy. And our, I believe that the United States is still the greatest country in the world with all its faults, with all its mistakes, past and present. However, we are so ingrained into nowadays to be politically aligned with the party and with the thought of the day that we don't have the free thinking that we should to, to make changes in our own society. And that comes to what I could refer to as groupthink. We need to get out of the groupthink. We need to have great, honest conversations to make our country uh, just as prosperous and not more prosperous than it was before. Then we can show others around the world how it's done in a good way. And we can learn from others as well. Uh, but yes, I agree. There's just too much politics in every level of our government today, and to include our military right now. And I think that it's really sad to see our military being used as a social, social experiment for political parties, parties, not just one, but both parties. And I think that the great thing about military in the past is we used to have an expression that is we protect democracy, but we don't participate in it. So what that means is we don't get involved in politics. We're here for one reason, that is to defend our country. If that doesn't work, to go out and fight and defeat the enemy, trying to uh, defeat our country. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. But, um, you know, I have faith in our, our people, our collective citizens in our country. We just had to get together and, and work together as one uh, race, and that's a human race, if we can say it that way. Dennis. How would the recent investigation on national security officers in the former Moon Jae-in administration reportedly colluding with North Koreans and affect those issues influence? Oh, I think it's going to influence a lot. The um, Unfortunately, in South Korean politics the last five years, you saw a lot of people that were against the Moon administration um, be put in jail or be sentenced, uh, for better or worse. Maybe some of them deserved it. I don't know. Uh, but certainly there was more willingness to uh, put people in jail for small fractions or try to create these uh, infractions and then really doing something wrong. And I think that these investigations are going to get worse because as we've seen that the uh, Moon regime, uh, pardon me, the, the Moon presidency, uh, the had a lot of dealings with North Korea and we have no idea what was done. Uh, so through these investigations, I think we're going to find out more. And that's just part of a democracy. We have to call it out as it is. And if things need to be done, they need to be done. I would submit to you, though, that the the last uh, the last um, presidency where they put former presidents in jail for a long period of time for, first of all, because they were from the other party, and then some of the things that they did wrong, uh, when ignoring the things that they're doing wrong within their own party, I think is dangerous for any democracy. United States or South Korea. So investigations are going to happen. I assume there's going to be probably many more uh, prosecuted or at least come to trial. And I just think it's part of democracy, a democratic process, as long as they do it in a fair and open process. And that's important. South Korean, South North Korean relations going forward. Well, the the I think the new administration in South Korea is first looking to strengthen its relationship with the United States, strengthen its military forces, and also reach out to Japan. I think they're all great steps uh, in order for South Korea to become the 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 leader it needs in order to then reach out to North Korea for better relationships. The Kim doesn't want to deal with um, weakness. Kim Kim is going to deal with strength, and uh, that's probably one reason why that Kim met with um, Trump. Uh, former President Trump. So it's the strength that shows the ability to interact and engage and not weaknesses. So I think that's what South Korean government needs to do first. Margaret, the uh, thank you for the presentation. The information can be applied to more than two Koreas and gives me, and given me a lot to think about. Absolutely. I think that, you know, unfortunately, we forget that the things that happen 
at the personal level, societal level, or international level. It applies to almost every conflict or every country around the world. We just have to try to be maybe culturally sensitive and have a deeper understanding of the regions before we take steps. But certainly the basic premises, the ideas, the theories can be used across the spectrum of different countries and different societies. I certainly believe so. So what is so bad about Kim's sister? <laughs> well, Gwen, um, from my perspective, to see the way that she's behaved in South Korea, when she was over here for the Olympics in the past, the way she behaves to other North Korean uh, elites, uh, the way she talks in the media about South Korea, I think is very dangerous. And I think that um, her upbringing within the Kim family uh, has has hastened her ability to feel that power. And I don't think she would be very good for the North Korean people or North and South Korean future relationships, to be honest. Uh, so are we about out of questions? Uh, yes, sir. I think that uh, covers it pretty well. Wow. The, I, I greatly appreciate all the questions. Uh, you've been a great audience. Uh, I hope that uh, we can have these conversations again. Uh, you know, anytime, I always say this to everybody, to include my former students, that you can always reach out to me and I'll try to answer or provide anything that I can for you. It's these, through, it's these kind of conversations that can really help us become better, uh, not only better in our own country, United States, but other countries around the world. So let's, hold, let's keep the conversations, let's have them more and uh, the, you know, Hopefully I can see each and every one of you in South Korea someday or the United States. Uh, so uh, have a great night. And I'll just wait for you here. It's now, I think, maybe two or three o'clock in the morning here because, again, I'm in Dubrovnik, uh, Croatia right now. But it's been a great uh, and a pleasure to uh, speak to everybody today. So thank you very much.